All right, welcome everybody to the July 2022 DAG monthly meeting focusing on inclusive development as a strategy to improve the economy. Uh, my name is Eli Storch. I'm the chair of the Design Advocacy Group, and I'm very excited to see everybody here. Um, in past months, uh, we have tried to redo a tradition that we've done in person, which was to go around the room and introduce ourselves. So if you wanted to uh, share your name, uh, why you're here today, and, and, uh, and what you do uh, for a living in the chat, Oh, it'll be great to see everybody and, and what everybody's up to uh, as we uh, all get to know each other on, on the call. So as we're, as we're getting warmed up here, please uh, introduce yourself. Um, so typically our, our DAG monthly meetings have been uh, off the record, but we have with Zoom the opportunity to record and share with a broader audience. So we've chosen to do that, uh, which also means you can head to our events page uh, on our website and you can go through our archive of events going back now pretty much two years and you can uh, and you can take a look at, at what we've been up to and the meetings we've had and and learn a bunch more about DAG and and uh, we've we've uh, we consider that a, a pretty nice net positive uh, despite not being able to be together uh, in person. Um, in addition to introducing yourself, uh, please feel free if you have any events, any uh, gallery openings, any exhibitions, any lectures, anything you want to share with the group, please throw that in the chat as well and we'll, we'll sound you out and, and give you a chance to unmute and talk about uh, what you have going on. Um, and if you have any technical difficulties, you can drop them in the chat for me or Lachelle Weathers, our, our wonderful DAG fellow, who is uh, who's here on the, on the Zoom as well. Um, so before we get to our, our presentation today, we do have a few advocacy updates. Um, so Kat, if you're available, um, why don't you give us a lead in on, on what you've been working on because I'm, I'm excited to, to share it with the group. Yeah, hi everybody, Kat Kendon here. Um, have you heard our updates over the last several months at Eli and I have been working on the Streeteries working group together. And that has just brought up a lot of questions about public space. And we are looking at starting a public space working group as kind of the natural outgrowth of the Streeteries project as that winds down. So we are just starting to put things together, but if anybody is interested in joining that group, there's just so much going on in Philly right now that is you know, this really interesting dialogue about what's happening with our public space. And I think it's a great opportunity for DAG to engage, think about it, make some public statements, write some articles. I think we could really have some good input and maybe um, create a little sea change on what's happening with our public space. So you're interested in that, let me know. I'm sure we'll release some information in a newsletter shortly so you can jump on board. Yeah, we'll be rolling that out on social media, on our website, through an e-blast. Um, if you're interested, dagfellow at gmail.com. Drop, uh, drop us a note that way and we'll make sure you get looped in with the group as we start to do our, our meetups, which are, are being planned for some in-person outdoor meetings to, to start meeting in public spaces and, and kick this group off. So I'm very excited about, about where that's gonna take us uh, in, the, in the coming months and years. Um, so the next up, uh, David, do you wanna give us a little update over on Christian Street? Yes, yes, indeed. I mean, I wanted to call attention to another thing as well. Um, at Penn this fall, in October, there will be a conference uh, devoted to the Philadelphia Row House, um, that iconic um, uh, Philadelphia architectural element. Um, many speakers, an interesting program that I, I'm sure that many DAG uh, regulars will be interested in. Um, and I did want to note, <clears throat> and I did want to note as as as, um, as Eli suggested, that um, that uh, two weeks ago, the Philadelphia Historical Commission. Uh, designated uh, the Christian Street Historic District that has become sort of nick uh, tagged Black Doctors Row, um, a, a, a row of, of uh, I believe it's um, uh, six blocks of Christian Street, east of uh, west of Broad Street, that <clears throat> was built just after the Civil War, but which in the early 20th century was the center of, uh, of African-American life in the center city area. 
um, and was, uh, it has to be said, was, was a center of, of extraordinary uh, talent um, for the, most of us in, in, in this room, uh, virtual room, we probably are most familiar with the name of Julian Abel, um, the chief designer in the office of Horace Trumbauer during this period. Uh, but he was joined on that block by other leaders of the African-American community. Um, and this is what we have pushed for for a long time, um, at the beginning of the of better recognition of the contributions of our diverse community in its, in its historical past um, as a foundation for the representation of, those, of, of this diverse community in the present. Um, it's a beginning, um, and, it's, and I do recommend to you, available online at the Historical, uh, the Historical Commission website, is the full designation text, which is a wonderful piece of social history writing. Um, this is a, a designation that is about social history um, as much as and probably more than it's about buildings per se. It's about people rather than things. A good, a good sign. Over and out. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that, that is... Uh... Hopefully, the first in a series as as we uh, as we proceed and and progress forward. Um, another advocacy item that uh, Dag recently published, uh, Alice and Harvey. You want to talk a little bit about uh, about the the about Councilwoman Richardson's bill? Yeah. Good morning. There was a, a um, bill that was put out by Gilmore Richardson called the Tree Bill, and it was centered around replacement of trees that were um, removed as a part of the development of sites in Philadelphia and it sets a series of guidelines and requirements um, for tree replacement. So DAG steering committee um, voted to um, submit a response to the bill with comments and that has been sent forward. I just dropped a, a link to that in the chat if you wanna read about that. Um, it's probably worth saying that we are very generally very strongly supportive of this of this measure of this bill. And if you if you go back a few months in our in our archives, you can see uh, Alexa Bossy. I see I see Alexa on here. Uh, Hinge Collective's presentation on the Philly tree plant. So you can see a little more about that. Um, read from that link uh, there on on our website about uh, what we sent into the councilwoman uh, as well. Uh, one last item is we uh, are continuing with our streeteries working group. Um, we've continued to meet with the Pennsylvania Restaurant and Lodging Association, uh, Councilman Dom's office. Uh, we've met uh, with uh, Beige Berryman at the Art Commission. So we're continuing to develop a, a deliverable that will be a website showing both what is currently in the legislation, what we consider to be best practices, and, and then in future once there actually is new legislation where, where we're going to go from there. So we will be rolling that out uh, later this summer um, and our, we have an, a great team who's continuing to meet and, and, and push that forward. So before we jump in uh, today, Marsha, I wanted to send, send this your way uh, to see if you uh, wanted to introduce our August meeting, assuming you've, you've banished the audio ghosts from your from your house. You are muted. So still hearing a little. Can you hear silence. me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, Hi, okay. all right. Um, we're happy to announce that leadership from the Delaware Valley Regional Planning Commission will be speaking at our August meeting uh, Barry Seymour, uh, Executive Director, uh, Brett uh, Fusco, Associate Director, and Jacqueline Davis, Manager of the Office of Long Range Planning, will be presenting Connections 2050. It's the plan for Greater Philadelphia. So um, join us to hear about the four-year planning process, its principles and uh, strategies to achieve a, a regional vision. That's Wednesday. August 10th at 10 a.m. Until then, keep cool and safe. Eli? Thank you, Marcia. Um, so let's get into it. Uh, we will have a Q&A at the end uh, of, of the presentation. So keep get those questions into the chat so we can make sure that we can answer them and speak to as many as possible. Um, and I will pass along the mic to Veronica Ayala Flores, our, uh, 
wonderful steering committee member who will introduce our speaker, Veronica. Thank you, Eli. Can you hear me clearly? Yes. Okay, my neighbor is playing some very loud music, so I'm glad you can't hear that. <laughs> so today's speaker, Gregory Reeves, um, has spent more than 30 years working at all levels in corporate and private industries. He graduated from Howard University with a Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering, and he's also played Division I soccer in college and two years as a semi-professional player. You don't get a lot of athletes here, so <laughs> good to mention. Um, he began his career with uh, McNeil Consumer Products Company, a division of Johnson & Johnson, where he worked as an engineer engineer in support of research, manufacturing, and packing operations. Uh, Greg then joined Merck & Co. Inc., where he received eight promotions and held 11 different positions during his tenure with the company. So early in his career, um, Greg also received a patent protection for a device he created while in tablet compression and was awarded a Gadsden Fellowship, a prestigious company-sponsored sabbatical, where while in sabbatical, he led the creation of an ed education partnership with the University of Pennsylvania, the National Science Foundation, and Merck to train um, Philadelphia school district teachers in science education. So as you can see, Greg has significant experience in a lot of different realms, including healthcare, commercial real estate development, government relations, uh, domestic as well as international public relations, and entrepreneurship. In 2008, uh, Greg co-founded the commercial real estate company um, Mosaic Development Partners, and they're a Philadelphia-based minority certified commercial real estate development and project management company. And Mosaic primarily focuses on ground up development and adaptive reuse of commercial properties and underserved um, urban communities, underserved, sorry. So Greg and his partner have successfully used viable finance instruments and highly creative design and construction methods to help stabilize neighborhoods and create jobs um, by partnering with municipalities, established developers, nonprofits, and government entities. Mosaic has leveraged um, its investments and revitalized properties in struggling communities. Uh, since 2012, Mosaic and its par partners have secured and invested more than 200 million in Philadelphia neighborhoods resulted in hundreds of construction and full-time jobs, eliminating blight and spurring additional investment in these communities, uh, primarily with bike park businesses. In 2020, a Mosaic was awarded um, through an RFP process, the rights to co-develop the Philadelphia Navy Yard. Um, this project represents a 20 year mixed use redevelopment comprising roughly 8 million square feet and 5 billion in investment of life science buildings, new housing, hotels, restaurants, and other amenity spaces. So with that, I'll pass the mic to Greg. Thank you. Thank you, that was a mouthful. Some, yes. <laughs> somebody needs to edit that. <laughs> so I think that would be me. Uh, I am going to see if I can share screen here and, and let me know if you all can see this. Are we okay? Yes. All right. Good morning, everyone. And it's a pleasure to speak with you. I see some familiar names and faces. I'm Greg Reeves, the CEO of Mosaic Development Partners. My partner and co-founder, Leslie Smallwood, many of you may know or are not. Uh, started this company, Mosaic Development Partners, in 2008 after meeting at a company called the Goldenberg Group, which was a commercial real estate development company based in Philadelphia. Uh, Leslie had been there a few years before I had joined, but by the time I had joined and we had met a few years later, we decided that we wanted to create something different. So I'm just going to go through a presentation. Uh, I typically speak extemporaneously. This is a more controlled uh, process for me, but it's going to talk about really who Mosaic is, what we focus on, our key areas of interest, and kind of how we think about investment and development. So let's get it going. Uh, first, I've already said that we're Philadelphia-based. We started in 2008. The presentation already suggested that we focus primarily on adaptive reuse and ground-up development. Uh, the neighborhoods that we work in really do uh, call for a lot of adaptive uh, work. We uh, talk about the fact that we work in 10 different neighborhoods and we have worked in 10 neighborhoods, typically the neighborhoods that are the most challenged uh, with the great exception of the Philadelphia Navy Yard. 
Uh, we are in Strawberry Mansion, in Sharswood, in Fairhill, in West Philadelphia, in Frankfurt, in the bottom. Uh, for those of you that, that know the areas, we are uh, all throughout North Philadelphia in our work. And we focused on the communities that have struggled most. And that really has required that we've done a couple of things. Look at buildings that have been uh, degraded for a long period of time, or in some cases we've had to demolish them and build ground up and come up with some new programs that we thought benefited the community. Again, we talk about financial instruments. Basically what we use these tools for is to kind of level set the cost and the opportunity for the neighborhoods. Whenever we get into a development, there's always a gap, a financial gap to be able to develop and do something that actually is sustainable. And so these tools become incredibly important for us to be able to execute a plan. And uh, in this case, it would be a development strategy. And then again, we're big on partnering. Uh, we, we built our model from the very beginning on partnership models. What Leslie and I realized is that it was impossible for us to do any of this work by ourselves, uh, particularly when you have two people that started with absolutely no money. And so uh, we did that, we did that on faith, we did it on our own inherent knowledge about business and uh, what we knew about real estate, but we also knew that these key partnerships were critical for us to be able to expand our business model. And it's continued to work for us today. Just This is just a summary, and it's, it just gives a snapshot. We're actually doing a little bit more than this, but we've done a really the 1.2 million square feet is also the removal of blight. We've removed probably that amount of blight in the city of Philadelphia and the work that we've done. Uh, the $200 million invested, that's directly in Philadelphia neighborhoods. That's in the communities that I've mentioned, most of which haven't gotten significant investments for many, many years. Uh, we're very proud of the fact that we go into neighborhoods that others have, have deemed unimportant and have made uh, an impact in those, in those communities. Uh, we're also a big, uh, when we talk about affordable housing, our affordable housing program is mixed income. We've only done one low-income housing tax credit project in our time. We do believe in uh, in affordability around an AMA range, starting really at the 60 AMI range, but we mix that with market rate. We're big mixed income developers, not affordable housing developers. And then the results of our work is just job creation and real opportunities, primarily for BIPOC communities and women-owned businesses. Here's some recent projects that, just to give you a sense. Our first project actually was a student housing development at Temple. Uh, we won an RFP. Uh, we actually developed this with the community in partnership with the local RCO. Uh, they own 22% uh, of the project. It's called Diamond Green, a 350-bed student housing development. We did that with them in part because in the Temple community, there were a lot of complaints about students living in row homes, which uh, we were talking about earlier, and creating havoc for neighbors. So we thought, let's concentrate them in a neighborhood. Let's work with the local community. Let's use this as a vehicle where we can hire local community members. In fact, we were able to hire about 50 local members of the community throughout the project to work on, the, on that building itself. It's a hundred and a roughly 30,000 square foot building. And it was uh, actually very successful. We just recently uh, sold the building in the last month, but we had it for 10 years. Um, Edison Square, this is, uh, this is in the Fairhill district. This was a food desert project. Uh, we, it was formerly the Edison High School, which is a 500,000 square foot vacant building that was known for, once it closed, it was had significant blight, there was significant problems, significant drug activity uh, and crime. It was the second highest crime corner in the city of Philadelphia at that time. Uh, we were able to redevelop that whole site into a grocery anchored site. Uh, we produced a hundred jobs there. 90 of those jobs were walkable. People in the neighborhood were able to access them directly. And that project is still open and operating and we own it today. Uh, Eastern Lofts, this was in Strawberry Mansion. It's a building that sat vacant for 35 years, uh, suffered from a fire. We received historic tax credits, new market tax credits on this building. And it really did spur significant development around this, this corner. But again, another block that was incredibly challenged during that time. 
And then this is just an example. These are examples of the type of work that we do. Cheney University, which is uh, really near and dear to our hearts. I'm a graduate of Howard University, but Cheney University, for many of you that don't know, it's the nation's first historically black college that was constituted. And in fact, there were only three that were constituted before the Civil War, Cheney University, Lincoln University, and Wilberforce in Ohio. Uh, and Cheney, uh, for those that don't know, was for many years really struggling to be able to stay alive. And as a part of the PASHE system, they were on the verge of closing, losing their accreditation. And Leslie and I met directly with the new head of Cheney. Uh, his name is President Aaron Walton. And we believe that uh, the HBCU ecosystem is critical to building wealth, particularly uh, wealth of color. We've seen that in other communities in Atlanta and the greater DC area that the HBCU system is central to creating uh, the future of attorneys, of, of physicians, of scientists, of engineers, of thought leaders. And without having a healthy and, and, and strong HBCU community, it's very difficult for the rest of the community to thrive and to be healthy. And so uh, we've been working with Cheney now for three years and really working on some, uh, I think some of the most innovative work in terms of rethinking a campus. So uh, that work's been really quite rewarding for us. Edison 64, this was our low income housing tax credit development. Uh, we, Edison High School, the, the place that suffered from significant blight, it also had a history, uh, you know, one of the most um, horrible histories uh, that I could think of. Uh, they had more people that graduated from Edison High School who went to Vietnam and died in Vietnam than any other high school in the country. 64 high school uh, members from Edison High died in Vietnam or, or as a result of going to Vietnam. And we wanted to honor that and recognize that the community told us of that legacy. And so as a consequence in the rear of that shopping center development, we built a, a veterans housing community. It's 66 units. It's called Edison 64. Uh, we are uh, partnered with the veterans housing group that has done really a tremendous job there. And we did it to really honor the history of that building that we thought we should be taking care of veterans there who have suffered. And many of folks that have dealt with veteran homelessness, and this was, this really is a project that's designed to stabilize uh, homelessness in the veterans community. There are so many supportive services that are required, and that is a component of this project. So uh, we're, we're, again, equally thrilled that we were able to execute this project as a part of our overall program. Galaski Labs, this is in Germantown. What's great about this project, it's, uh, I think we talked about buildings being buildings, but the biggest part about this building in Wayne Junction was it was there's still you know, quite a, a significant amount of drug activity going on in that area. And I think a lot of it has to do with still the COVID, uh, post-COVID situation. But what's great about that this building was uh, the Galaski family had it since the 70s. It was originally a manufacturing facility. It had closed and had been vacant and, and, and uh, really dire straits for a long time. They reached out to us and said that they had been asked to uh, tear down the buildings and put a CVS there. And they said they wanted to do something more for the community. And what we thought was we could bring the building back and make it more of a community focused building and add some mixed income residential with that. And we were able to work with them together to build that program. And now what's happening there is actually pretty amazing. There's a group run by a gentleman named Suleiman Rahman. It's called the P4 Hub. And uh, we were able to bring Suleiman in and Suleiman had the concept of bringing not-for-profits, African-American and, and women entrepreneurs together in a space where they can have supportive services that are focused on uh, credit worthiness, on banking, on working together, on excelling skills, upskilling folks, bringing new ideas into uh, the fold, bringing authors, bringing leaders. They recently had Ken Frazier uh, attend and provide a symposium there. Ken, uh, for those that you don't know, is a former CEO of Merck. He was he graduated from Edison High School, 
and went on to Penn State and then Harvard Law and ran uh, and was CEO of Merck for 10 years. And now he's still the chairman of the board. But he came to the P4 of Hub in Germantown to talk about how he's uh, working on creating a million jobs for uh, for people that haven't graduated from college or, or don't intend to go to college. That anchored program is going to be housed for the Philadelphia market at the P4 Hub. So really excited about the programming that we're doing there. We also have a woman-owned makerspace that's going in the lower level of this building. Uh, we have offices there, and then we've brought some mixed income residential as a part of this program. Sharswood Ridge, we're very excited about this project. And in fact, in two weeks, we're having a grand opening for our grocery store. It's also a food desert. This is in the Sharswood community at 21st and Ridge. If any of you know where the Philadelphia Housing Authority's new headquarters are, uh, this is the project that's right next door to that. They, uh, they moved from Center City with the belief of some years back that they wanted to make a statement in neighborhoods that businesses can relocate in neighborhoods and away from Center City to help create the fabric and recreate the fabric of the neighborhoods. And so they made a big bet by putting their headquarters uh, right at Ridge and Jefferson and then they made another bet by saying, we're going to support a developer who comes in and creates an ecosystem around food and the food desert. So they put out an RFP, we responded, we were ultimately selected. And what we're doing here is 100 units of mixed income housing and a ground level shopping center that will include a grocery store, a healthcare center, a bank, uh, two sit-down restaurants. These programs are something this community hasn't seen in about 50 years. Uh, we're, we've been under construction. We've got under construction at the end of 2020. We'll be open uh, fully in the fall of this year, but the grocery store actually opens in two weeks. So we're really excited about what this means for the community. Uh, it's actually no longer a $48 million project. It's increased quite a bit. Uh, for those that are in the middle of construction, I think you know what, what we've dealt with during COVID. But uh, one thing that's been great about this project is the whole project was built modularly. Uh, we, have a, we have about a 234,000 square foot development on six acres. Uh, there are four buildings. One was a precast building that was built by high concrete for a parking garage at the ground level. Of that space, we have both the grocery store and a 13,000 square foot healthcare center. And then we have three buildings that surround the perimeter that were all modularly built uh, with a podium uh, based on a podium. There are four story podium buildings in the front and a three story walk up in the rear that acts as a wrap around the parking garage. So uh, we were able to design conceptually these buildings and bring this project in at a cost using. Uh, union labor uh, that I don't think has been met yet. And that's part of the challenges that we have when we're looking to bring uh, quality programming to neighborhoods is being able to match the cost of building it. We think that this is one of the methods that works and that uh, we've been able to be successful using it. And then the Navy Yard. Uh, we <laughs> the, the Navy Yard is just something of its own. Uh, and Craig, who I, I know is on here, Greg's, Craig is very familiar with everything that's going at the Navy Yard. In fact, he evaluates the work that our team is doing. We're partnered with a group called Ensemble Investments. And uh, the Navy Yard is a multi-year program that's dedicated to recreating a new community. Uh, what we say is that Philadelphia just got bigger. Uh, the Navy Yard has been in the past, it was a former Navy for you know, 150 years or so, and then uh, the Navy closed through their BRAC process, and then PIDC, Philadelphia Industrial Development Corporation, they took over that space, I guess, in 2000, and then uh, sought to create really a, a commercial center, one that houses the shipyard, one that ha houses corporate companies. Right now, there's about 150 to 175 companies that are operating there full or part-time. Uh, there are 17, anywhere from 15 to 17,000 people. This was definitely pre-COVID. It's been a shift post-COVID. And, but there were no residences that were allowed to be there. There was never private residential there. For the first time with our project, uh, we are going to have private citizens be able to live at the Navy Yard. 
With that comes a number of other amenities. We also have a full commitment to increasing the life science component there. There's already five or six life science buildings that are operating at the Navy Yard and various capacities. We're, we have under construction a 140,000 square foot lab building that we're very excited. But beyond that, we have a very large commitment to the life sciences. We partnered with a group, uh, Oxford Properties. Uh, they are a large uh, investment fund out of Canada, actually they're the largest municipal uh, Canadian fund that is very focused on the life sciences and they'll be working with us on the life science development efforts all the way through uh, to the end uh, as our agreement states. But in addition to that, we're planning to build about 4,000 apartments, some hotel operations, uh, bringing in food service, uh, daycares, uh, and, and really creating a new community in, in essence. We have about uh, 1.2 million square feet of, of open space that is planned there and, and active recreation space. And in addition to the incredible waterfront that uh, not only are we going to honor, but we're going to uh, make sure that our developments recognize and are resilient and, and meet the challenges of storm surge and, and climate change. So uh, we're really excited about what's been happening there and, and the involvement that we have there. And I'll talk a little more about it. This is just some pictures of before, the before and after look. Uh, you can see Edison High in the top and you can see what it is now. Eastern lofts, it had the roof burned off. We kept the roof off and we were able to create interior courtyards. Uh, there's the veteran housing project, Galaski Labs. If you look down, that's the new Galaski. And then Sharswood Ridge, where we're opening the grocery store. We actually, it actually looks like that, believe it or not. That's a rendering, but it's actually pretty accurate. Let me just go through where we are in terms of our mission, because we are really mission-based. We are a for-profit company, but we're a company that's built around certain values. Uh, we do want to bring positive change. And sustainability for us is sustainability that also includes, that's culturally, culturally inclusive. Uh, for us, it, it was never enough to just build a building and to de determine that highest and best use was, were the most rents that we can secure in a particular neighborhood. It was always about who is a part of the development that we're creating, who gets to, who gets to participate, who gets to use the services, Who's the full beneficiary of those services? That's what we determined to be sustainable. And then at the end, can we pay for them over the long term? We also are really keen to partner with people that share our values and our vision, uh, even if they don't look like us. We believe that it's very difficult when you get into these projects. It's really a marriage. You're always in these projects for anywhere from five to 10 years or more. And if you're with somebody who doesn't align with your values that you're going to have problems eventually. It may not show up in the first year, but it will show up. Uh, we are very committed to driving what we call full inclusion. Uh, there's been a lot of focus in the city of Philadelphia over the years around construction jobs, and we we'd certainly believe that that's a focus. But there's as many deficiencies in this industry in legal services, in architectural services, in engineering services, in the brokerage community. If you look at every category of community that affects real estate development, the lack of participation of women and people of color in significant roles is, is startling, frankly, for us and something that we've worked to change in our ecosystem. And we've been fully committed to that. And in all of our projects, I think you'll see a difference. Uh, we do have a hybrid development approach. And what we mean by that is Leslie and I have we're able to survive for years by, by ourselves. And the only way we did that was because uh, we were always including third party people. We never tried to bring all of the services in house where we would have significant overhead. We would seek out third party attorneys that could act as in house counsel, third party architects who uh, supported our vision. So we would do a lot of our own internal work uh, and then we'd bring architects in who would work with us and understand what our mission was and continue to do that. And we do that on a third party basis. So as projects come up, we bring folks in as needed 
and they're able to work with us. What's been great about that approach is that it's also allowed us to really grow diversity uh, in these different areas without having to really focus on having it in-house. And so we've done that across the spectrum and we'll continue to do that as our company grows. And then again, we are committed to affordability, mixed income, high quality developments. And as we continue to grow to scale, what we're finding is, and what we're, our challenge is how do we translate uh, particularly the high quality design and for an architecture group, uh, one of the challenges we've had is bringing that level of design to communities of color that haven't had the benefit of those designs. And so that's, that's really the challenge in the frontier that we're faced with now that we continue to start to make progress, but there's still more work to do. Uh, this is our core principle. It's autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Uh, we, we believe that people should operate independently. We believe you should be expert at what you do. And then we also believe that you should operate with a value system. And our value system and our ethos is pretty big. We, we found this quote from Tasio Date that talked about Shukanen, and it's a craftsman or an artisan having the skills to do the work, but it also implies that you have to have a social framework, a social consciousness to do it. There are people that are very technically gifted, but in our view, don't match our social ethos. And so we, we want all of that to really matter. Let's just talk about our investment approach. Uh, we are really interested in, in high impact and that's, that's evolving as our company grows. But what's really interesting about that is it, when we started the company, we thought, let's just find a high value block in a marginalized neighborhood. And if we can bring light to that corner, uh, that, that really end piece of, of a community, then maybe that can spur investment around us. We never tried to be the full investor in a neighborhood. We always wanted to be a catalyst. And that's still what our mindset is. Again, I think our team speaks for itself. It's incredibly diverse. We continue to grow. It's a great group of folks. But we are building our talent organically because the diversity in this industry isn't easy to find. So many of the folks that we have came, they just happen to be very smart, but they don't have the skills, uh, the requisite skills from the past. Uh, we think that we are pretty good at mitigating risk, uh, no matter what neighborhood that we're in. Uh, so from an investor standpoint, they would tend to think that the better risk profile is to invest in a center city project, or you name the location, Northern Liberties, Graduate Hospital, even the Navy Yard, uh, that those lower risk, higher return, higher reward. Well, the neighborhoods we go into, people don't think about those neighborhoods as low risk neighborhoods. And so part of our strategy, and really Leslie focuses on this significantly, is how do we generate equitable returns and mitigate the risk, which is mostly, in our mind, emotional risk that people have about being in a particular neighborhood or investing in a particular neighborhood. And again, we're very big on working with local communities, RCOs and the like to ensure acceptance. Uh, we, we do recognize that there are times when we don't agree, uh, but, it, but it doesn't stop us from having the conversation, having the full dialogue, sharing with neighborhoods about what we're doing and why we're doing what we're doing. And we do take their opinions into account in all respects, even though there are times when we believe that our ideas might be the better idea given the circumstances we're dealt with. This is uh, what we kind of focus in terms of our equity impact. Uh, our, we align uh, our investments with social and wealth building. Uh, we are very big on not just investing, but investing to build wealth in neighborhoods. Uh, the focus for Mosaic has been, and our operating mindset is, is not just providing kind of social relief. We, we don't think that's really solved problems for communities of color, particularly in Philadelphia, that's maintained a, a significant poverty rate, really the highest poverty rate of any major city in the country, even though there's been billions of dollars of investment. We believe that that's, that's a, a product of 
not investing in wealth building for communities of color. And so that's really been our focus is how do we build wealth in these communities? When, when uh, I'll give you an example, if for $100,000 of wealth that's invested, the African-American community in this country represents about 13%. So you would imagine $13,000 of the $100,000 would go to the African-American community. Well, in fact, it's about $1,300. So the wealth gap is so significant that until we start getting that wealth building in the African-American community up to a point that's commensurate with their, with our population, that we won't have the ability to really affect change in a positive way, that it does have a direct impact on poverty and on crime and on all of the issues that create the social ills. We think that wealth, while not the only uh, determinant of outcome, is a significant determinant of outcome. So again, I think I've reiterated this. This is our strategy. We, we want to have significant economic impact and primarily supporting BIPOC and women on color uh, businesses. Uh, we use third party again, and we're focused on really real estate within 150 miles. Philadelphia is our, our base, but we are working in communities outside of Philly and bringing this same idea. I talked about modular manufacturing. We're fully committed to it. I, I have an engineering degree and I spent a lot of time in manufacturing early in my career. And one thing that I've learned, and I'm also a car nut. So I think about when you're making anything, uh, I'd rather have it factory made than handmade for the most part. That's not true for furniture. It's not true for some things that are custom, but anything that is repeated, uh, that has the ability to be made over and over again, that doesn't have a lot of, of unique design to it. Most of what we're building are boxes, can be factory made and made well and drive costs down. We've seen it in the automotive industry. We've seen it in, uh, well, I would like to say the pharmaceutical industry, but they, they tend to, to not price on the cost to build, <laughs> the cost to manufacture. They, they price on the cost of their innovation. So, but when we look at these industries, if we can really perfect the box and build it in a system, we can drive savings directly to customers, which is the thing that Leslie and I have been able to see. We don't think that it's been done well in the United States. We've seen ex uh, exceptional examples in Europe where uh, factory-based home building is done at a very high level uh, using robotics, stabilizing uh, building systems and being able to drive real affordability uh, in housing. Again, I'll just talk about how we invest. It's primarily urban centers. We like to be close to public transportation for obvious reasons, but if you look at the cost of uh, a low and moderate income family next to housing, the second highest expense is typically the cost of a car. And so if we can figure out how to make transportation more equitable and viable, that tends to just reduce their baseline costs. We do reposition land and building infrastructure. I think we're actually really quite skilled at that. And uh, this is really the area where we focus on. We're in greater Philadelphia, the Baltimore and Maryland side. We've actually expanded into Maryland, Delaware, and we've been asked to come into New Jersey. We've actually turned down a couple of op opportunities in New Jersey for various reasons, but we're still open to it in the future. Uh, we, when we talk about industrial rehabilitation, uh, we are not industrial folks. Uh, most, our work is really mixed use uh, and different asset classes, but not really industrial. Uh, we do like working with universities. We have relationships now with Cheney University with the University of Pennsylvania, University of Maryland, Wilberforce University, uh, Delaware State University. We do believe that there is something there. There are signals around community development that these institutions play such a significant role. And if working together from a programming standpoint, we can create some really great P3 opportunities that will also help build communities of color. And so it is something we've focused on the last three years, and we're starting to see some significant traction there. And again, we, we go after typically underutilized or underperforming buildings. Uh, and just in terms of our capacity, we believe we're pretty experienced. 
Uh, we know how to put teams together. Uh, we've been working with some of the best design firms, at least uh, particularly in the last three or four years in the country. And we've learned quite a bit from having the variety of design firms available to us. And then uh, we, we're very strategic. We can work with almost any local government and come up with some new plans and programming that we think makes sense for the benefit of the community. This is just real quickly what, how much we're, time we're spending. Most of our time's in Philly, but again, we are expanding. A lot of us think of us, think of Mosaic as Philly only, but we're really not. Um, and again, we're residential commercial value add. And then other is, I don't even know what the other is, but uh, that's where we are right now. This just gives you a sense of our pipeline, how it's grown over the years. Philadelphia Navy Yard being the largest by far. It's about a $5 billion, 8 million square foot development that will occur over the next 15 to 20 years. We're in our first phase right now. I know Craig is very aware of that, but right now our first phase is $500 million. We have five buildings coming online. The first is under construction. The next buildings will be two buildings that are residential. Uh, we're partnering with the Corman family on both a luxury and mixed income building that will operate together as, as a kind of a single communal structure. Uh, we think it's the first of its kind, but we're really excited about the possibilities. Some will be full, fully furnished, some will not. Uh, so it's a really exciting opportunity for us with this, uh, with this program. And then we're planning some additional life science buildings as part of this phase. Again, uh, Cheney University, we're very active in Chester County, doing quite a bit of work there. With Cheney, and I'll show you a slide shortly, uh, we have quite a bit of work there and really completely rethinking what's possible on a small university campus that doesn't have a University of Pennsylvania endowment. Uh, university of Pennsylvania, we were just recently awarded a project to develop an office building at Penn. We've been working with them the last few months and really excited about it. Down in Delaware, we were awarded the master plan for the downtown district where we're in the middle of planning that community now. We're working with an architecture firm called Bernardin, uh, with Econsul, and with Kimley Horn uh, to really rethink what's possible in these downtown communities. One thing that we know, and Philadelphia has pockets of these downtown communities, these smaller communities, is how to activate and re-amenitize the ground floors and re really rethink about how do you provide density? How do you uh, recreate food deserts? How do you bring necessary amenities to spaces and communities that have really struggled to bring that back? And then uh, finally, the University of Maryland, we were awarded a, a $200 million project, uh, which is at this point a housing project. We hope to be able to do more with Maryland. We're partnering with a group called Campus Apartments, their Philadelphia-based housing developer. And we're working with a uh, community of architects, Gensler uh, being one of them, and Michael Marshall, who is actually one of the top 10 African-American architects in the country. Uh, who we formed uh, the two of them with a joint venture partnership to work together. In all of these cases, we're doing that. We're partnering uh, uh, BIPOC businesses together to help us execute our development strategies. This is Cheney University. Just so you know, Cheney is a more than 200 acre site uh, in Chester County, Chester County being the wealthiest county in the, uh, in the Commonwealth. Uh, and we, when we got to Cheney, we, they, what they said to us is we have lands, we have land and we have buildings that are underutilized. What can we do? And Leslie and I quickly looked at that and said, well, let's think about a process with you where we can really reestablish where universities should be. And our focus was on, on STEM, fundamentally STEM and active sports and rec. And so uh, where you see those programs at the university level, we are really executing what I think is a groundbreaking program with Cheney and looking to now scale that with other communities that we work with. One of the big things that we've done is we're, we're, we've worked with Cheney and with the, with the state to rethink the use of a gym. For example, Cheney had a gym that's as old as the 60s. It needed to be replaced. There were dollars available and we said, well, look, rather than just replace the gym, why don't we think about something that is community focused or community forward? So we worked with Cheney to talk with the state about creating 
an active sports and recreation facility where we're doing a full size indoor field. Uh, we're doing a, a three quarter size secondary field. It will act as a convocation center. It will act as a student athletic center, but it will also be able to be used every day by the community, the local community, their local teams. They can rent the fields and we have surrounding fields that they can rent as well. So not only does this provide a benefit to Cheney, but it also provides a benefit to the community because they have a need for these services too, and they're willing to pay for it. And so we thought about this as a way to help build upon what Cheney already had, but also provide some stabilizing income for their ongoing services. We did this with a few of the buildings that they have too. They actually have an underutilized science building. And what we said is you have these great labs, but there's not a lot of lab activity going on. Why don't we bring some science businesses in? And so we went out and we actually recruited four. And now that building's filled. Uh, Navigen being one of the key, they're a cancer research company. They were located at St. Joe's, they're now at Cheney and they're operating fully. They've expanded all of the businesses that we've actually brought in have expanded their operations there. And what's great about it is not only are they now paying rent in, in this building, but they're also all hiring interns from Cheney and they are paying them uh, income. So all of the, the interns are receiving um, um, a check. They're getting real life experience in a laboratory environment. And, uh, and we're coming up with an income model to help Cheney uh, reinvigorate underutilized facilities. We're doing this at a number of operations. We've got a 3D printing operation that's coming in. We have a program called the Thinkubator that is going to be a lab incub. It's the WeWork incubator. You know, there's some, there's a number of incubators in Center City. There's two or three that are, are in Center City. We're doing it on an HBCU college campus, which hasn't happened before. Uh, we were able to get a $5 million RACP from the Commonwealth from Governor Wolf. Uh, because of this concept, we're working with a group, IPS, large lab designer, uh, who is uh, helping lead the lab design around that effort. And we're really excited about what this is going to do. We're also working with the Wistar Institute, who's come on Cheney's campus and is providing specific programming both at Cheney and at Wistar's labs in West Philadelphia. So we're, we have a solar panel company that's signed on. We have uh, at Advanced Alchemy, which is a hemp processing company that signed on. Again, we have a 3D printing company that signed on. And we're really excited about these companies coming on and have not only committed to using the space and paying rent, but hiring interns, uh, allowing Cheney to share in, in future net income, and really being a part of the ecosystem around STEM creation, engineering development, and, and the future of science. So uh, this is something that we've been working on and we're just really excited about. This is the Navy Yard. This is the old piece of the Navy Yard. It's now doubled. Well, not fully doubled, but the number of units now that we plan to build are closer to 4,000. We still have about 350,000 uh, square feet of, of retail and maker space. And the maker space is kind of retail plus. It's a retail front with back of house so that folks, if you have a, a winery and you're looking for warehousing space, you can have a front, uh, front facing uh, marketing component in the back, you can have a warehouse piece. So we're doing a mix of that. Uh, we, we have um, significantly more investment in the, what we're calling uh, the waterfront district. Uh, and then we have our, our science district that is in the rear of what was formerly called the Mustin district. So we're building a life science campus. We're building a mixed campus that's on the waterfront. We're building a campus that's in the historic core. Uh, and we're really excited about where this is going. We've already started construction. I guess I should have gotten to this early, <laughs> but uh, this is Leslie. Many of you know her, that's me. Uh, we've been doing this now together for 14 years and believe it or not, we still get along. Uh, so just outcomes for us. Uh, our outcomes are measured by more than just the return on capital, but, but it is you know, who's participated in our projects and do we have a significant amount of equity? At the Navy Yard, I think we can attest that 50% of professional services at the Navy Yard to date for the spend that we've had have gone to BIPOC and women-owned companies. I think that's a first. 
And for a project of that scale, we're, we're incredibly excited. What we're more excited about is the way we've been able to put those projects together. We have had folks that haven't had the capacity to do the work that come from BIPOC backgrounds. And what we've done is we've partnered them with teams that have the capacity to do the work and define very specific scopes with the goal of being able to help these companies grow so that eventually they can do the work and they can be the leads. We've done this with the engineering firms. We've done it with our architecture firms. We're doing it with our legal teams and it's really working. Uh, we're, we're very excited about it. In fact, in one instance, uh, from an architectural side, we, we have a $300 million phase of a project that we didn't have a local architect who we thought can handle the capacity. So we, we were working with a group called Moody Nolan. Moody Nolan is an African-American owned architecture firm based in uh, Columbus, Ohio. They're the largest African-American architecture firm in the country. They just won the 2021 AIA award and we brought them into Philly and they've since opened a Philadelphia office as a result of being able to work with us. They're partnering with Digsaw, who is a local firm. Many of you know Digsaw, a great local firm, on this aspect of the project, and have, it's really uh, gone well. It's, uh, we have, in other instances, brought some other local firms. We've brought uh, Kelly Maiello on. We brought 15 on to do work with us. We've brought Moto on. We've brought Michael Johns on. Uh, we have Digsaw, we have CRB, we have other designers, but the level of diversity that we've been able to bring to the Navy Yard in such a short time is something that we have been incredibly focused on and we feel great about. Uh, again, we'll just see, we look at diversity in all areas, architecture, engineering, brokerage, construction, and operations. A lot of times folks think, don't think about the programming of these spaces, but we do. Uh, it's not enough to just build the buildings and, and, and have your brokers go out and say, I need to lease a space at $30 a square foot triple net with a $5 cam. We, we also want to make sure that the people that are operating those spaces are given real opportunities to be successful and come from a diversity of backgrounds. At the Navy Yard, at least 25% of those spaces on the ground floor are, are being reserved for women and BIPOC companies. What that means is that we have to think about strategies that allow them to come into those spaces and be successful, primarily on a financial side, because the other businesses that we're bringing in are probably credit tenants. They probably have multiple uh, locations. They can really come into a new community and be able to build up and, and, and build their clientele where other small businesses can't do that. So... Uh, this is something that we've been incredibly focused on and we continue to be focused on. And just mixed income, that's part of our ethos. We, we have been asked to do a lot of affordable housing projects and we've declined. And the primary reason is that we've seen what happens when you concentrate poverty and the outcomes are never good. And so we don't believe in it. We believe that we we should not create programs that concentrate poverty, even though those programs are, you know, they're set up structurally, financially, that that's how you have to create them in some instances. Uh, we, don't, we don't believe it's the right direction, but we also don't believe that we should concentrate wealth communities either. We believe that all communities should be thinking about, you know, how do we mix wealth with lower and moderate income families because the benefit really comes to the broader community. And that's something that we're committed to in all of our projects. And we've been able to demonstrate that in everything that we do. And then uh, really what so many people are talking about is how do, you, how do you think about providing adequate services for low and moderate income people? That's, that's one of the big challenges that we face. It's a huge problem that we face in Philadelphia. It's, one of the ways that we have to do that is to focus, we believe, at least on wealth creation and on stabilizing low and moderate income families and giving them real opportunities to grow out of low income status. Uh, this is just this, I believe this is the last slide. Uh, again, uh, economic conditions. Uh, we have a business model that's opportune time to develop with multicultural focus, governments looking to team. Governments are now, and I think this is probably post-George Floyd. Leslie and I have been really following this the ethos since 2008, so this is far from new to us. What's interesting is since George Floyd, people have actually been reaching out to us and saying, hey, are you guys kind of developing this way? 
But prior to that, there wasn't a lot of, um, there weren't a lot of uh, phone calls and people knocking on our door. <laughs> so, uh, but the conditions are such that I think there is a recognition that multicultural development is something that's, that's important, particularly in the urban core. Uh, we do focus on second tier cities. Uh, we are not interested in being in New York, for example. We haven't looked to expand in Miami. We are in, not that Philadelphia is second tier, but it's not at the level that we see in New York, for example, or in LA or in Miami. But we do see Philadelphia because of its poverty rate being so central to solving problems uh, that are important to us. But we also see a lot of smaller communities that have the same needs and that we think we can really have an impact. Uh, we also are really focused on what young people think and where they're headed and what their interests are. We don't think that they're, um, they should be dismissed. They have uh, incredible ideas. Our question from Mosaic is how do we harness their energy and get them to really see what we're doing and play a role in what we're doing. And then the Navy Yard we think is just, you know, uh, such an incredibly, uh, incredibly unique opportunity for us to have. We believe it's a pr pristine piece of real estate. And with intentional design, we have an opportunity to create a community, we think in the way that it should be created, that has the level of equity that should be offered, that people see themselves being a part of it, that it isn't an exclusive development. It's a high quality development, but it's built with a lot of people being involved in it. Uh, the university systems that we think are really important uh, because of their access to government. And so in P3s, we think that there's a real opportunity there. And then uh, really we see growing demand pressures for more women and minority owned businesses in this space and the development of them and nurturing of them being important. And I think I will just let that go and, and move on. These are just, again, uh, value creation strategies. We talk about this. Some of this presentation was geared toward investors, but uh, but for us now, I think we can just move on, right? All right. And with that, I'm happy to turn it back. <laughs> Thank you so much, Greg, for that presentation. Um, we have been tracking questions and comments. Um, so Let's try to have a little bit of a conversation here. Um, so, yeah, I, I think you addressed actually my first question as, um, in your comments later in the presentation that you mentioned being a big uh, mixed income developer and you know why you find yourself uh, gravitating towards that kind of development. Um, do you have any comments uh, on kind of the current affordable housing, housing crisis and kind of the role that we should all be playing here? Um, maybe some thoughts on our current methods to address affordable housing. Yeah, any, anything you'd like to share or expand there? Yeah, I, it's, it's a, I do. Uh, I, I think it's more of a wealth problem than an affordability problem because the reality is no matter how cheap you can build it, if you don't have the income to support the home that you're in, it doesn't really matter. I've seen this happen with Habitat, for example. Habitat for Humanity has had programs in place where they're gifting houses to people for doing their sweat equity, and then they're taking the houses back because those folks can't afford to maintain those homes. We have to provide a baseline of economic support for folks to be able to have a level of affordability so that they can stabilize. Uh, that, that requires more of an effort of community wealth. That requires higher income jobs. It requires investment. We don't think about poor people as being investors, but that long-term investment strategy, if we can create a community investment fund where they can participate in and have dollars that are working while they're not, uh, that should be something that needs to come into the system. I think we just don't pay enough attention on the wealth part of stabilizing communities of color because we're, we're so far back from wealth equity. We're so far behind in wealth equity that until we start to focus on that seriously, just providing a house for somebody is not going to solve the problem. Uh, we created a, a program, Leslie found it uh, through a community crowdfund because we had spent the first three years trying to find African-American developer, uh, African-American 
investors in our projects. We had had meetings with probably 500 people in Philly under different auspices. We started out asking for something as modest as $50,000, right? We thought that was modest. Then we dropped it down to $5,000. In all of those meetings, we had two takers and they were two white guys, by the way. They weren't black, they were white guys. So, so we realized that there's a problem that people don't, they just don't have the wealth. They don't have it. And so we found a community crowdfund called Small Change that allows you to invest as little as $500. And what that does is that gives you the opportunity to go in at a number that at least you feel that if you lost it, that it wasn't going to break you, right? And so we, we believe in using methods like that, meeting people where they are, and then creating kind of education around that investment so they understand the importance of passive investment, not just living or considering your only investment being the house you live in. Keep, keep in mind, even if that's the case, because we talk a lot about home ownership in the African-American community, but when African-Americans have owned home in their own communities, the appreciation of those homes haven't materialized at the same level that they have in gentrified neighborhoods. So you can own a home for 20 years and sell it 20 years later and not make any money. And so depending upon the neighborhood you live in, so it's not really an equal balance. And our, our focus is wealth building. So, so I think that's where we have been focused around affordability that we think that affordable housing can't occur without wealth building programs. Yeah, thank you for that answer and for that example um, of, you know, a model that we can replicate. And yeah, I mean, even your comments around, you know, even if you own a house, like selling it and also estate planning practices are mostly, you know, a white culture kind of practice. Um, so um, we had a follow up question from Andy for for the mixed income residential. Are they mainly rental or are they also home ownership? I guess related to the, the conversation we're having. So we're doing home the to date, they've been rental. Uh, what we are doing in the, we do have about, I think 70 home ownership projects coming up now that we're going to break ground in the next couple of months uh, in, in uh, Strawberry Mansion, in Germantown. Uh, and we are going to have mixed income strategies there for home ownership. So uh, from our standpoint, this is again, why we want communities not just to think about home ownership, but we want them to invest in even our rental projects. So you don't have to build wealth in a neighborhood that, or in a building that you live in, you don't have to live in that building to build wealth. So we're looking at it from both standpoints. We don't believe that home ownership or rental is as important as wealth, as how you think about wealth. But we are, we are employing those same strategies around home ownership to answer your question. Thank you, Greg. Um, so pivoting a little bit, but still related. Um, so a lot of communities are really fatigued from the kind of check the box community engagement efforts that we see out there. Um, how did you set up your model or process to ensure that your efforts don't contribute to this fatigue? Could you say the first part again before check the box? Sure, just many communities are fatigued from that kind of check the box efforts. Um, and so how did you set up your model or process to ensure that that's not the case? Well, I don't know if we set up the model or if we just started calling folks. We, the first thing we do is say, who's the RCO? Who's the head of the community? And we call them and we have a conversation. This is what we're thinking about. Can we have a conversation? We talked to the community. Look, we, we are partnered right now, and I didn't even mention these projects. We're partnered with ICPIC, which is a, a Muslim-run local community organization at 42nd and Lancaster. We're partnered with Zion Baptist Church uh, that's located in Broad and Venango. We're partnered with the Franklin, our, uh, uh, in, in Frankfurt, I'm sorry, Franklin Township uh, Transit Center. We're partnered with them and the Franklin community, the Frankfurt community uh, groups, specifically people who are on the ground in the neighborhoods talking to folks about what's important to their communities. And so we work directly. We don't seek their approval. We partner with them. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we share our information with them and make them stronger and give them the ability to, to manage their neighborhoods better. So I think part of our success if we've had success is being on the ground and listening to people on the ground at at all points of where they are but primarily at the low points and so 
uh, we believe in community building. So that's, that's why our company has been focused. We've scaled to much larger projects. We're doing a lot of large projects now, but one thing that we're committed to is working on the small community-based projects because it keeps us grounded in what's really happening. And so it's, it's part of not just checking the box, but it's part of what's your, your, strat, your business strategy. Uh, and our business strategy is being community-based. Yeah, so really baking it into everything that you're doing. Appreciate yeah. those comments. So we have like one question kind of related to this and then two buckets of question, one um, bucket being the Navy Yard and then module, modular development. So mm -hmm. I'll start with, um, can you give us an example of what cultural inclusive development looks like? Can you say more about that? Yes. And so for us, it's looking at the entire development ecosystem and ensuring that we've got inclusion, at, that, that we've considered uh, women, people of color, BIPOC communities in all aspects, because typically uh, what that means in the past, they haven't been considered, or we've been told that they're not there, or you can't find those folks. Right. We found them. Uh, they may not have the same capacity as we haven't had the same capacity as larger developers, right? We understand that uh, not capacity problem that's brought up all of the time, but just because you don't have all of the capacity doesn't mean you can't execute the plan if the plan's provided in a way that's executable. And so we, we seek out for every project that we have, and this is every project that we have, an inclusive approach to development. It doesn't exclude anybody. I want to be clear about that. We don't exclude anybody from the opportunities to work. But if we feel that there's an imbalance uh, that's been available, particularly on the construction side, what we do is we create partnerships for these teams to work together. We have a, a, a contractor right now who we're working with that's really trying to grow. And he's been working with us on smaller projects. And we have a, it's, it's about a $17 million development and which is much larger than he's ever done. And we can easily go to, you name the contractor, seven or eight contractors that can do it in their sleep. He can't, you know, he couldn't do it on his own. He couldn't do it in his sleep and he doesn't have all of the skills. So what we've said to him is we're willing to give you the opportunity for this project, but you have to bring in a partner. You have to bring somebody that's capable, that gives us and really the lender comfort that you're going to be able to execute this strategy. And so what we've done is we brought him in early into our development and design process so he can sit and listen to it from the beginning and understand what we're building, how we're building it, what are the concerns, the civil engineers are there, the architects are there, uh, we're there as a developer, and we're talking through all of the issues so that when he gets to the point of construction, he should have a really solid understanding of what we're building and, what, and how we're building it. And, but we still recognize he still can't do it by himself. And so we take that approach with really every skill set that we bring into to our, our team and our programming. Really appreciate that. Um, and, and kind of clarifying that you're not talking about the aesthetics of the building necessarily, but actually embedding you know, people throughout the process and, and being part of that economic development. So really Absolutely. appreciate that. Um, so I'm gonna move towards the kind of bucket of questions of the Navy Yard. We have a lot of those. Um, so as you know, a lot of the communities that you're working with have a, a lot of suffering and burden from past and new environmental justice issues. Um, and so some climate projections are showing that much of the Navy Yard will be lost to sea level. And so how are you thinking about the long-term viability of this project so it doesn't become an economic loss uh, to the new residents and a burden for the city in the future? Yeah, and keep in mind, we're, we're the risk, the primary risk is on us. <laughs> so right? so we're, we're investing billions of dollars in the Navy Yard. Craig's very aware of everything that's great. Craig knows more. You should ask Craig this question, actually, rather than me. He's been there much longer than I have. Uh, what, what I do know is that we have brought in James Corner uh, uh, Field Operations and a team of civil and environmental engineers to work with us around resiliency and climate change stormwater management. Uh, we were working on the local lower school component. And I feel confident that the plans that we have around resiliency are solid, that the way that we're addressing climate change is solid. We have a full program. We just released uh, the Navy Yard plan and we have pages dedicated to how we're really looking at the Navy Yard. 
Keep in mind today, every new building that's built is raised at least five feet, every building, uh, there are no exceptions. Uh, some buildings in some areas will have to be raised nine or 10 feet. Uh, we have those plans that were there. We're looking at resiliency and emergency release programs. What is the timing that if you do have a flood that people need to get out of a particular place? I mean, the biggest thing we will think about are you know, protecting people from loss of life. But we do think there are plans you can put in place over the next 100 years. And we've planned for the next 100 years with our new design uh, to make sure that we're really managing it in a strong way. This is not a problem unique to Philadelphia. You know, This is a problem that is uh, that the world will be facing. Uh, we're just part of it. I, I will make the point too that part of the issues that happen in South Philadelphia and you know, water runs downhill are also problems that were caused by people that are upstream. Uh, so, so we think about pervious and impervious spaces, maybe we ought to be thinking about some of the space that wh whether I wouldn't say the redevelopment authority or the land bank, I mean, how are we treating properties in terms of green space that are in higher levels in the city. I mean, why aren't they required to maintain a certain level of water on their grounds for a certain period of time? Why are, why are we pushing the problem downhill? And mm -hmm. so those are some of the things that I ask and would consider that the city should consider as well. And I know they are, but this is something that it's a communal program. It's not a, a, a mosaic and ensemble and Navy Yard problem in and of itself. I appreciate those comments. Um, two follow-up questions, and then I want to let Greg, um, Craig, sorry, um, make some comments. Um, again, related to this kind of environmental justice issue, we know that the airport is close by. Um, any plans on the kind of jet fuel disposition for the site uh, on the new developments that you're working on? So, I, I, I'm not sure how to answer that. Uh, frankly, I don't. I, <laughs> I'm sure. That's I'm fair. sure we'll manage through that. I don't. I don't really have a response to that. But thanks for the question. Yeah. Sure, just a flag for the future. And then, is the insurance company uh, been a partner in in these efforts? The insurance company. Yeah. So right. Joyce is kind of wondering. Um, You're saying Oxford. Oxford's not an insurance company. They're they're a uh, a pension fund. They're the largest municipal pension fund in Canada. And yes, they have been involved with us uh, on these projects. They've, they've been very, actually they were the lead developer in Hudson Yards, if anybody's been to Hudson Yards in, in New York. Um, they, they were the lead investor and developer at Hudson Yards and so they're down working with us. Very sophisticated group. Uh, we're thrilled to have them as a partner. Great, Joyce, let me know if that answered your question. Um, and uh, is the Navy Yard going to be more accessible by foot or uh, public Hello? transportation? Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, uh, my video went away for some reason. I'm not sure what happened, but sorry. Um, you're back. <laughs> so, or I'm back. Great. Um, yeah. So the question was if the Navy Yard, if there are going to be improvements to accessibility via public transportation or by foot. Yeah, that's been a really big area of focus for us. And from our standpoint, the reason why we care about it so much is because of equity, um, mm -hmm. providing equitable opportunities for people, particularly people who are low and moderate income, to be able to access the Navy Yard in an affordable way. Uh, we have looked at really all modes of transportation. We had tool design working with us. Uh, as part of the team, as part of the master planning team. And what we're looking at right now in terms of the quick hits, people have also always talked about extending the train uh, down, the, the, the subway down to the Navy Yard. That's been talked for, Craig, how many years? And it hasn't come to fruition. The cost of that has only increased substantially. There are certain groundwater issues associated with extending that, that train that are problematic. But we're looking at something called bus rapid transit. We're studying that with SEPTA right now. We think that could be a much faster solution. We know that it works. Uh, and then what we're looking at is creating, once you're on the campus grounds, creating the, the ability to be able to access uh, the various areas of the Navy Yard through an internal system, an internal mode. And so uh, we're pretty excited about what we're doing. We're actually testing the first autonomous vehicle in the Commonwealth at the Navy Yard. That will be coming, I believe, in the next month or so. Uh, we do think that there's some real utility there. Once you get into the Navy Yard, 
but we want to get people to the Navy Yard. We're also very focused on extending bike trails down there. We're, we've put together programs and plans where we think that could be done in a couple of different ways and locations. So that could be bikes, e-bikes, and the like that really offer some opportunities for multimodality. Uh, we have these multimodal hubs that we've created as a part of the plan. So it's something we care about a lot because we don't believe this long-term solution is cars. Thank you for those comments. Um, so Craig, did you want to close out this set of questions about the Navy Yard? You're muted right now. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, I guess, first of all, I want to thank Greg for a fantastic presentation. Uh, and what he shared with you today is something incredibly unusual uh, in terms of the breadth at which a developer is looking um, at a comprehensive approach to an area. Uh, and that really, that really came through to me in the presentation. I may have heard it before, but this was exceptional. Uh, and to understand the where, where their opportunity kicks in from where we started with the Navy Yard. Um, and the fact that when, when, when the city was originally looking at buying the Navy Yard and having PIDC buy it rather, the city didn't wanna take that risk, um, was that this was an area as large as all of Center City and many developers just said, put a fence around it and in 20 years we'll look at it. Um, and at that point, the decision was to create it as, as a commercial, as a business or manufacturing center and to get something for the shipyard. And in fact, when the Navy transferred the property to PIDC, there was a specific restriction against doing any residential. Uh, so for the first, uh, for the last 20 years, it's been, no, no, we're not ready to have you do that because for two reasons. One is the Navy found more uses where they wanted more of the site on the Navy Yard, even though um, they had sold it to PIDC. And that was for, if you ever hear about the Aegis electronic systems of destroyers, whenever the Defense Department brings anybody in to redo it, this is where they're done. And so for security reasons, they didn't want residential. And it was finally when, when the PIDC said, well, we'll sell you back some of the land, but you've got to remove the restriction on residential. And that fundamentally changed the whole picture. Um, and I think also with that, that over the years, if you looked at the amount of development that Liberty Property Trust, who's been the develop, major developer there for 20 years, how much they spent at the time, maybe a hundred million dollars uh, would be the, much, the most that they ever spent on a single building. So the fact that Greg in the first phase, um, they're talking about doing 400 million um, is both an incredible uh, ambition, uh, and for some people, I think an incredible risk, but the way they've started out on um, 1201 Normandy, which is a life science building, they have uh, really found whole new things in doing that project already that show their innovation and creativity and having Oxford uh, as a partner. Um, and I think the next thing is going to be see how the residential is done down there in terms of creating a whole community. Um, and we talk lots about that in the, uh, in the design review sessions, um, but the fact that they're tackling all these issues and what I've learned from doing design review there for 20 years is none of this happens overnight and each project sort of sequentially um, adapts new uses and goes forward and occasionally um, there will be a misstep. I, I won't name the one with Liberty, but one architect they brought in was like the wrong architect. This architect is interested only in aesthetics and his design and not really the Navy Yard. And I think what you're doing here is, um, is, is being all encompassing. And so I'm, I'm really, really excited for what you're taking on. Um, it's more than any other developer has taken on, but uh, what you've shown today, I think shows the capability of approaching that, um, but you can't do everything at once. And I think the idea that you're gonna solve everything at once 
uh, is something that, that people have to understand because the minute something upgrades something, well, now we can upgrade something else about it. It's like, right. it doesn't always work that way. And outside investors, they do need a return on investment. Um, and uh, Greg, I think you've struck an amazing balance uh, in that regard. Thanks, Craig, for that context and comments. Um, so I think we're running up against time. So I'm going to do one last question. Um, how does modular development impact employment slash business partnerships? It's a really great question. So we have what, what modular development allows, and folks will think about really the expense. One of the issues that we're dealing with particularly in Philadelphia, is the high cost of construction. And not just the high cost, but the high cost in comparison to other markets. We're higher than most other markets uh, based on the way that we price construction and construction labor in Philadelphia. But the downside of that is that we're not nearly the highest in terms of overall incomes. So when you look at the rental prices uh, of New York and DC, for example, much higher rents that they're able to garner for similar construction costs. And in DC, they're lower construction costs than Philadelphia, but can get almost double the rent. You, you don't have the spread and the spread, the lack of a spread hurts you, particularly on affordability. For people who can afford to pay for that, that's, it's, it's never been the issue. That's not the problem I'm trying to solve. But for people who can't afford to pay for that, it's a problem. And so we've talked with the city about this multiple times that we need better systems of building. The only thing that I've seen in this industry that hasn't changed is folks are still using hammers and nails, right? You still have the same folks putting together buildings, building in the way they built a hundred years ago. Some of the materials have changed, you have power tools, but there's no systematic change to construction, which is the highest cost of the whole design and development process. So if we can change that, if and, and if you think beyond just steady state, that should give us the ability to expand markets of house building, not just build houses cheaper with lower labor. We ought to be able to expand the labor market. If you build in a manufacturing and factoring setting, we ought to be able to bring more women and communities of color into those factories. We've already demonstrated that when you bring factories in, you could bring women and people of color into those systems. It's not happening today in the way that we're constructing. So we think you can solve a lot of problems by bringing manufacturing systems into the construction industry and doing it in a way that expands the opportunities rather than thinking, well, we're taking jobs away from the people today. We don't see it that way. Well, thank you so much for all those incredible nuggets um, of wisdom. Uh, I'm gonna pass it out to Eli to close us out. Yes, we, we at this point, Everyone who wants to turn their uh, their screen on and, and we do our, our virtual round of applause. Uh, thank you, Greg, for joining us. Uh, it's wonderful to have you with us. Um, and uh, we will be pushing out a bunch of new content as it relates to um, the public spaces program that Kat was talking about. Uh, go read about that tree, uh, the tree plan or the tree bill on our website. And we'll be back August 10th to talk with DVRPC. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy your Thursday. All right. Take care, Thank everybody. You. Thanks for your time. Great. Thank you. Bye now.